I'm really excited about today's recipe, you guys. It's a key lime streusel cake. The key lime can be key lime, or it can actually be key limes, depending on the, their availability, so don't worry if you can't find them. And to start off this recipe, you're gonna make a graham cracker streusel inspired by key lime pie. In my food processor, I have nine full sheets of graham crackers, so that's like one whole sleeve. And you wanna grind them up until they're fine. Every single time I grind up graham crackers, there's, there's always at least one or two pieces that don't grind, and here they are. <laughs> I don't know why that happens. They get stuck, well I do, I'm lying. They get stuck in the blade. Sometimes what I do is I take those out, put the lid back on, turn it on, and then drop those through the feed tube in the hopes that maybe they'll grind up. And if they don't, don't worry about it. You can always take those out and eat them. Or you can call it. Anyway, get it mostly ground. <laughs> oh look, it didn't work at all. Great tricks there. All right, I'm just gonna take these out. Sometimes you just, there's nothing to be done about it. You have to stop grinding. This is enough. I'm adding my graham cracker crumbs to two thirds of a cup of all purpose flour. To that, add a half a teaspoon of kosher salt. If you're using fine salt, use a quarter teaspoon. Three quarters of a teaspoon of ground cinnamon whisk together. We have tried to make graham cracker things using just like graham flour and cinnamon and like baking it and it always tastes better if you just use pre-baked graham crackers and grind them up. The crusts never taste quite grammy enough even if you use all the ingredients that are actually in graham crackers. So that's why I'm not just making my own streusel here using those ingredients. To that, add two-thirds of a cup of brown sugar. You can use light or dark. If you use dark, you're gonna have more of a contrast between the cake itself and the streusel, so you decide. And then to that, add eight tablespoons of unsalted butter. This is cut up into pieces, and you just work it in to your streusel mixture until most of it is about the size of, I would say like a coarse cornmeal or something like that. It's a sort of standard language that we use, but it should all be worked in. There shouldn't be any lumps or pieces left because you're not looking for pockets of butter like you would in a pie crust, for instance. You want all of your dry mixture to be evenly moistened. It doesn't need to form into clumps because it's gonna bake into the cake and it'll solidify basically in there but if it holds together in clumps, you know it's good. Everything is moist, so. All right, next we're gonna do the batter. So for this batter, you are going to zest and juice some limes. I have regular limes here, which are perfectly fine and actually taste great here, or these cute little key limes, which as you can see are so tiny that they would take basically a million to make the amount of juice that we need, which is only a quarter cup for this, but then there's a half a cup in a syrup, and it, it's a lot, so you can do it. And if they're in season and they're really juicy, you'll get a pretty decent amount of juice. And the zest is actually really, really fragrant, which is nice, and I'm using that in the cake, so I'm just gonna zest one of these. But honestly, when I was developing this, I did it with both, and it's so delicious with regular limes. Do not bend over backwards to try to find these tiny little key limes you can know and bake with confidence that the regular limes will work, and even lemons would work in this recipe. So anyway, you'll need to flavor this cake batter, one and a half teaspoons of lime zest, which you can get from one or two normal sized limes, but it might take about five or six of those tiny limes to get that. that looks about right. Totally depends on how sharp your zester is too. Like a sharp zester makes a huge difference. And then you also need a quarter cup of juice, but I've already juiced enough limes for that. In this mixer, I have one stick plus six tablespoons of unsalted room temp butter and one and a quarter cups of sugar. To that, add one and a half teaspoons of baking powder and a half teaspoon of baking soda. I've started mixing my leavener into my butter when I'm creaming. I learned that from Stella Parks, who works at Serious Eats and is one of my favorite bakers. The leavener really distributes much better than if you're whisking. It's just you know that it's mixed in if you're mixing your butter for two minutes. So thanks, Stella, for that tip. And also one and a quarter teaspoons of kosher salt. 
three quarters of a teaspoon if you're using fine salt. Always remember it's about twice as salty, so you wanna make sure to use less. And a lot of our recipes call for kosher salt, so remember that. You can also add the zest, one and a half teaspoons of zest. Feeding the zest in with the sugar also releases the aromas, so I think it's great to do it at this stage. You could also cream your butter and sugar and then add it, but I just like to get it all in there. And then you don't have to whisk your dry ingredients together and worry about whether or not you added your baking powder or your baking soda or if it's distributing properly. It's all in there distributed. Give the bowl a scrape, just to make sure everything from the bottom of the bowl is getting cream just as evenly as everything else. And then this recipe calls for three eggs, and you wanna beat them in one at a time. I'm gonna crack my eggs into a bowl, and then tip that egg one at a time into the mixer. When you do it one at a time like this, you can make sure that your eggs are good, that there are no pieces of shell in there, all of that stuff that you wanna look for. I've told this story before, but I have a friend who told me a story about a friend of theirs, and they were baking, and they actually had a really bad egg. And they hadn't done this one at the time, so they dumped the whole thing in, and the entire thing was ruined. I was like, that's not true, but I think maybe it was true. I'm gonna scrape down the bowl one more time. I can see that the egg is not fully combining with the stuff on the bottom, and that happens with mixers sometimes, so that's why we recommend stopping and scraping down the bowl every once in a while. The last egg. And then I have a quarter cup of lime juice and a half a cup of whole milk, both room temperature. And you're gonna add those alternating with your flour. And the flour is two and a half cups of cake flour, which is going to give you a more delicate cake and because cake flour most often is bleached, it's a lighter, lighter color. More delicate, overall, finer. You could use all-purpose though. D don't worry, like if you don't wanna go out and buy cake flour, just use all-purpose. It's not gonna be maybe exactly, exactly the same, but it'll still be good. Make sure that your milk is room temperature so that it doesn't make the butter seize up and look curdled. That's the best way to incorporate it. Sometimes I cheated and generally my cakes come out okay, but it's not the best. You shouldn't, you know, you should do it right. Do it right. For the best, loftiest, most well-combined, tender, delicious cakes. Follow the rules. But I'm such a, I'm just not a rule follower. I just can't help it. Maybe I am, I don't know. A quarter cup of lime juice can go in as well. And then the last of the flour. Make sure you're doing this on a low speed if you don't stop it because otherwise it will go flying everywhere and you'll be really unhappy. And that half a teaspoon of lost flour is gonna ruin your cake. It will. But it'll be a mess and you'll be mad. Okay. So Turn the speed up just a little bit once the flour is partially combined to really fully combine everything. Your batter should be nice and smooth and delicious looking. You may want to scrape down the bowl one more time, but it looks pretty well incorporated actually. So I'm going to take it off and give it one more stir off the mixer just for safety. This is when I always have to really avoid the temptation of licking the beater, which I used to do all the time when I was young. When I was a kid, my mom would give me the beater, and I think a lot of people grew up doing that, and now everybody's so paranoid about it. I never let my kids do that. I have my oven preheating to 325 degrees, and I'm gonna bake this in a 10-cup bunt pan mold. There's lots of incredible styles out there. They're all super fun. This is a very well buttered and floured bunt pan, and just make sure that when you're, you're buttering it that you get into every groove. But these new bunt pans are so great and nonstick that you really shouldn't have to worry too much. We had no problem getting our cakes out of the pans, and we made them many times. So that was one cup of the streusel in the top of the mold, and then half of the batter. 
Uh, you can measure this. Sometimes we use a large ice cream scoop so that we know that we're doing it evenly. I'm just going to eyeball it though. It's not super important really that it be perfect. I'm creating three layers of streusel and two of cake. Bang. If you do want to bang it down to make sure it's even, make sure you put something underneath it like a towel so you don't break your counter. Then another cup of the streusel. I like to make a nice even layer on this one because then you have a line of streusel going through the entire middle of your cake, which is really nice. It'll sink in a little bit, it'll be a little bit organic, but cover the entire surface. Don't just, don't make a channel down the center. The remainder of the cake batter. You guys should see all the fun bundt cake shapes that there are. Bundt cake pans, I guess, that make fun shaped cakes. Bunt technology has really, really gotten great these days. <laughs> Not just one shape anymore. Okay, spread this evenly. You can use an offset spatula or just use your rubber spatula. And then the remainder of the mixture becomes a crumb on the bottom. But because it's baked on the top, it remains a little bit uh, crunchier. It's not crunchy because it's a crumble, but it's more, it doesn't get soft. So you get different textures with your streusel here, which is kind of fun. So we already have one layer of liminess in here. Well, two really, because we have the, the lime zest for fragrance and aroma and the lime juice for acidity. And then when this comes out of the oven, I'm gonna do a syrup and a glaze. Then get this into your 325 oven and bake it until the toothpick inserted in the center comes out clean, 45 to 50 minutes. When your cake is baked, what you're going to want to do is put the whole thing in the pan on a wire rack for about 15 minutes to cool and then turn it out. And I turn it out directly into a rimmed baking sheet like this because now what I'm going to do is make a syrup to sort of soak into the cake and you need something for that to happen on, right? Because it's going to go back in the oven to dry the syrup out a little bit. This is a half of a cup of sugar, which I already have in my saucepan. And to that, add half a cup of fresh lime juice. Again, key lime, regular lime, lemon, all of them work. Whisk to combine. And then what you want to do is bring this to a boil and reduce it just a little bit so it gets a little bit syrupy. That only takes about a minute once it comes to a boil. While I'm waiting for that, I think I'll just make the glaze. So this is a two-step glazing process. One is a syrup that's very thin and very acidic and delicious and it makes it taste so good. And then the outer glaze makes sort of a crust, like a shiny crust on it. And that you need about one cup of confectioner sugar with about two to three tablespoons of lime juice. I'm gonna start with about one. You can always add more, but if you add too much, then you have to add more sugar and you're going back and forth. So start small. When you glaze this cake, you want it to still be warm, and the same thing goes for when you um, add the syrup. This isn't completely mixed, but I'm gonna go back over here where I'm making my syrup because I see it's come to a boil. I just wanna make sure that, that there's no sugar on the bottom that hasn't dissolved. That can cause burning. And then, since it's already at a boil, I'm just gonna let it cook there for about one minute. It's already been simmering probably for about 30 seconds, so maybe only 30 more seconds. This is good. Now what you do is you take your syrup. It's just very, very slightly thickened, and you brush it all over your cake. It's going to seem like kind of a lot of syrup, and in fact, there might be some that sort of drips down onto your pan. Uh, you want to scoop that up with your brush and brush that over your cake too, because the idea is that this sort of soaks in as much as possible to flavor throughout your entire cake. Sometimes when people do this method with a pound cake, for instance, they'll poke holes in it with a skewer or something. I didn't do that in this instance, but you certainly could if you wanted to. But then you might start worrying and being thinking like, oh, it's going to be soggy. But what happens is you put it back into your oven. So when you take your cake out of the oven and take it out of the pan, don't turn your oven off. Because putting it back in the oven will dry out the exterior a little bit so that it isn't soggy. This is my favorite. 
This is my favorite part of the cake. And, and this actually might be my favorite cake that we did in the entire story, but there's some really, really great ones. They should all be online and you can have access to them. All right, this should just go back into the oven for five minutes just to dry out. Okay, for the final step of this beauty, brush it with that glaze. You want it to still be warm while you're doing this because you want the glaze to coat the entire thing in like a shiny shell, but you want it to not remain completely white. Like there could be a little bit of opaqueness. You can see it's already happening. It's, it's smoothing on there and it's creating a sort of semi-opaque crust. And the great thing about this is that it kind of protects the cake from drying out, which means that this cake lasts a long time. When I was on the shoot, the day after the shoot, I was traveling to California to visit some friends and I wrapped up this cake, not this exact one, obviously, but this the lime cake from the shoot. And I wrapped it up and I brought it with me to California. And so that was like the next day. And then I served it at dinner the day after that. And then we ate it for breakfast the day after that. So we enjoyed it for three days and it did not get stale. It was really good. And you can see how pretty this is. Just so nice. I love it. I can't say enough about it. And buns are also really great because they serve so many people. This serves like 18 or 20 people, I guess, depending on your level of enthusiasm, <laughs> for lack of a better word. I don't know. You just have to let this cool completely. After a few minutes that it's been out of the oven, you can lift the entire thing up and put the cake on a wire rack to cool so that there's air circulating all the way around it. But uh, you want to let this cool completely before you serve it. I waited, you guys. It's cool. It's ready to slice. And I am ready to eat at least one bite. <laughs> I eat sweets almost every day because of my job, so I tend to try to eat not too much of it. But look at that. Oh my god. <laughs> so exciting. It's fragrant. It smells limey from all that amazing zest, and I bet you, mmm, mmm. I don't even know what to say. It's so delicious. The tang is what really gets me. I love it so much. You guys should really give this recipe a try. If you like recipes like this and you want more, make sure to click like and subscribe because we have plenty more where this came from.